Pastor. Um, good to be here. Uh, believe it or not, 50 miles is doable. I'm telling you, it's not really as bad as everyone makes it sound. Uh, I know I didn't finish it, but <laughs> none of us finished it. I thought about saying, Tommy, you know, I'll do a rematch with you on Monday, but uh, I got to get back to Kansas. Sorry. Uh, maybe October and come down for the Potluck 100. Uh, it's good to be here again. Good to see the church growing. Some of that, I think, has to do with the babies that we keep having, and I understand that. That's one of the best ways to grow a church, and we're, we're trying to do that in Kansas as well. As well. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, good. Be, good. Thank you for the uh, the orchestra. You know, I don't think I don't think that was going last time we were here, and about a year ago. Were you guys doing that? Maybe maybe you were. Maybe you just started or something. But you know, a lot of times you go to a church, and if they have an orchestra, it's a volunteer orchestra, and you're like, oh boy, this is going to be. <laughs> but no, man, these guys really know their parts, and I know Brother Daniel has worked with them. Uh, doesn't he give lessons to everybody as well? So. Man, I appreciate the work there, and it's a huge blessing to the service. And so, uh, anyway, <clears throat> all right, got all the formalities out of the way. So let's go ahead, if you would, and open in your book. I guess you're probably already there. It is Psalm 51. Psalm 51. The title of the message is A Clean Heart. A Clean Heart. And you can tell from the text where I get that from. And I thought about titling the message. An inward cleansing, but that might take on a completely different connotation <laughs> nowadays. An inward cleansing. No, we're talking about the inward man, okay, the heart or the, uh, uh, the attitude and spirit, you know, that we have. And it uh, talks about cleansing here. There's a lot of, word, uh, a lot of, of terminology uh, speaking about clean, cleaning and, and all that. Basically, cleaning is the removal of dirt, right? I, I looked it up to see, is it? That was my definition, and then I was like, is it, is it more complicated than that? Let me look it up in the dictionary. And the first dictionary definition online that came up was free from dirt, marks, or stains. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. My only contention with that is, uh, some, you know, I've seen things that are clean, but they have a stain. You know what I mean? Like you might have a stain on a shirt, and you've got, you've got the shirt clean. I mean, it's completely clean, but it still has some residual, like, stain that was left there that you can't get out or whatever. And I guess you could say by that definition then that the, the, the shirt is dirty, but really we know that it's a clean shirt. It just has that stain that you're never going to be rid of. And man, that's a great application for us in our life. We can do some things in our lives that though we get that out of there and we could stand before God and said, you know, God, look at my heart. I'm clean. And everybody else might say, you're not clean. What about that stain? What about that thing you did? But David is a great example, isn't he? How he committed all these sins, yet he stood before God and said, you know, other, other psalms where he says, judge me, O God, search me. And, and, and so he's, he's, he's saying, like, I'm clean. I've done what's right to get right with you and to get these sins out of my life and to have a right heart and a right spirit. And God looked upon him. And no matter what other people thought about that stain, the, the things of the past, I mean, he can't get rid of it. I mean, this... This psalm right here, how does the, how does it hit, how, how's the heading to the chief musician? A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. I mean, I suspect every time they sat down to read this, uh, to sing this as a congregational song in the, in the temple, they had to look at this heading. I don't know if it was there or not, but in say, you know, oh yeah, this is that song that he wrote after his sin. You can't get rid of it, you know. Uh, praise the Lord, Rahab the harlot. I don't think she continued to be a harlot afterwards, but she's still seen in the Bible as Rahab the harlot. Other, where, other places, maybe not. Maybe it's not said that. Uh, there's a place where the uh, Bible talks about the, the woman who was a sinner, right? Well, praise the Lord, she's not anymore, but yet that stain is still there, that, that idea. So I want to talk about the idea of cleaning the heart, having a clean heart. And uh, it says there in verse 2, wash me thoroughly. Not thoroughly. I was, uh, I was glad he went. I was, I was listening whenever Brother Josh read that. Is he going to say th uh, thoroughly or throughly? Because I listened to it uh, while I was running yesterday. In fact, I was listening to an online recording of it. You know, somebody uh, reads it and they said, they said thoroughly. And I was like, I don't think that's right. And I went ahead and looked it up again and I said, it's thoroughly. But I've probably said thoroughly whenever I'm <laughs> reading it. So uh, uh, he says, wash me thoroughly. Uh, from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Look at verse uh, verse 
3, he says, My sin is ever before me. He says in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Uh, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So we see, obviously, there's this talk. He's just using this terminology about cleaning over and over. He talks about blot out. First thing you do, you got... Uh, uh, well, maybe I should tell you this first. I, I, I used to be... I used to have my own cleaning business. I guess by definition, I still do. I have some cleaning jobs that I do on the side. So I've been in the cleaning industry, I guess you could say, for a long time. Doesn't mean, I mean, don't go look at my car and my house and, <laughs> and everything. I don't do very much of the cleaning at home. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, but my wife, if she catches me, you know, at a good time, if I'm on the phone having a phone conversation, she knows how I work because it's just second nature for me to just be cleaning stuff. So she'll be like getting a rag and spraying it and handing it to me. While I'm talking on the phone, I'm sitting there wiping the top of the fridge and, and the blinds and stuff like that. It's just, it's just second nature to me. But don't expect if I come to your house that I'm going to do that. But I might. I might. <laughs> but I won't judge uh, because we all have dirt, don't we? We all have dust. We all have uh, all these things. And so a few things I want to talk about here. Uh, when it comes to cleaning, I find this very interesting, having been in the cleaning industry and, and uh, trying to figure out what types of chemicals to use on different things. And of course, if you're like me, I, I prefer to go natural. Anybody in here like that? The mo most I can, I want to use natural cleaners and, and all that kind of stuff. Don't want to go too crazy uh, on the, you know, there's this thing out there. And if you're like this, you know, hey, I understand. There's this thing, this thought out there that, you know, if something smells like bleach, it's clean. I'm going to preach against that. <laughs> that. That bleach is such a strong smell. But I understand what they mean. It's just this, I, you, you smell that and you're like, okay, someone's been cleaning in here. Well, how do you know that? They might have just dumped a little bleach out. And, you know, it, but anyway, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, but I try to you know, find things that work that are natural cleaners or whatever. Now in the places I'm cleaning right now, they supply the chemicals and all that stuff. So I'm sure it's not uh, natural stuff. But as I began reading through the Bible... I saw reference to a lot of, I guess you could say, uh, supplies that they used, you know, for cleaning. And the first thing that, that I thought as I was reading all these things, I, I thought it was really interesting. Uh, look at Job chapter 9. We'll, we'll look at a few passages of Scripture here. Job 9. One, uh, one book back. And uh, I'm just giving you one verse of all of these, but uh, there's several places you can go that, that, you know, confirm this or talk about the same thing. But this was kind of interesting to me. Job chapter 9, look at verse 30. If I wash myself with snow water and make my, uh, make my hands never so clean, yet shall thou plunge me in the ditch and mine own clothes shall abhor me. So, uh, so wash myself with snow water. And I thought about it, that's kind of interesting. Uh, why snow water? And I can't say 100% that this is why, but here's what I know. If you drink uh, bottled water, how often do they make reference to like the Arctic or something like that? <laughs> like this idea of just this fresh, clean uh, ice or whatever. But here's the thing about water. If, you, if water is, if it reaches freezing point, all the bacteria is pretty much dead, right? I mean, I, I don't know how, what percentage, but I would say the majority of it. That's true with uh, all kinds of things. Bacteria, you can freeze it. Or, what's the opposite? Boil it. Once it reaches boiling point, all the bacteria is gone. Well, the thing is, not only do you have this, cold, this snow water, this pure, it, came, it hasn't been contaminated, unless you believe what they say about acid rain and all that, but <laughs> it came down, and, uh, and, and then not only that, but it's frozen, there's no bacteria. And then, how do you turn that snow into, into something that you can use? Well, you've got to defrost it somehow, probably apply it to some heat. Maybe it reaches boiling point or whatever. I'm talking about just pure, clean water, which, of course, we all know this. Water is the best cleaner that there is, right? I mean, obviously, you add different things to it, but your house could be washed with, with water, <laughs> you know, with clean water. The majority of, of the cleaning is done with water. Uh, they sell you all this stuff on the market, uh, Windex. Now, I don't know how much you're spending for Windex now, but you know Windex has the equivalent of like one drop of like something like Dawn dish soap. You could get like this big bottle of water, add one drop of Dawn dish soap, and you got basically Windex, okay? 
Uh, but for some reason, we'll go out and spend, and I, I do too. <laughs> All this girl, <clears throat> not true. Actually, we have a natural cleaner that we do that. But, but uh, so water is important. Just clean water. Bible talks about hyssop in our in our text here in Psalm uh, 51. It talks about wash me with hyssop. Now, if you study out hyssop in the Bible, most of the times it's going to be referenced to like an application. They use it as an application. So if you take this hyssop, and hyssop comes from like the mint family. It's very similar. So if you look at the mint plant and the little flowers that they have on top, uh, you know, I never really knew that. I always thought about this branch. And I thought about like in the Passover whenever they dipped the branch in hyssop. And I'm thinking that wouldn't make a very good paintbrush. But actually, if you study it out, the plant hyssop, they did. They gathered all that together, tied it up, and it was like a paintbrush. And so they used that to uh, put the blood on the doorpost, and the priest used that to uh, sprinkle, uh, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So hyssop, most of the time when you read about it, it's just talking about the use, using it to ap apply something. Uh, when Jesus was thirsty on the cross and they gave him vinegar, uh, you know, not to quench his thirst, but be, to kind of mock him, uh, what did they use? A hyssop, right? So they used this applicator and they put that on there and put it on a rod or whatever. And so, uh, but here's another thing about hyssop a lot of people don't realize Hyssop was used in a lot of the ceremonial type things, uh, uh, you know, probably the incense or whatever. I don't remember what all they use it for, but when they did sacrifices, they would add some hyssop. And you could take, I'm guessing, the flowers and all these uh, parts of that plant, and it has an antiseptic property to it. In fact, mint does as well. It's from the same family. You could take mint. Uh, maybe you have mint soap or something like that. It's got some kind of antibacterial uh, uh, properties to it. And so the Bible talks about that a few times about cleaning with hyssop. Uh, there's a lot of references to soap. Actually, the word soap is in the Bible. Yes, yeah, so, or the fuller soap. I don't know if you know what a fuller is. If anyone knows somebody with the last name Fuller, probably that says that at some point their family came over as immigrants and they were known as the Fullers because their job, what they, were, they, what they did, was to clean the clothes. And they would take the clothes. And, uh, and for instance, uh, Brother McMurtry was talking about, Pastor McMurtry was talking about uh, uh, mixing fabrics this morning. He, at one point he mentioned the, the linen and, and wool. Well, here's an interesting thing. A, a Fuller would take a wool garment and it was more than just cleaning it, but what their idea was to make that, those wool fabrics to be thick and full and, 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 and it would make it more beautiful. And so like you think about that, if you're mixing, if you're mixing those, those uh, materials, when those fullers went to go do that, it would actually ruin the garment. And so you wanted something that was completely full. I'm not saying that's why that passage says that about mixing fabrics, but I'm saying that that, that was something in my study that I thought that was, that, that was kind of interesting. But the fullers would also use a soap, a type of soap to clean all these things. What was in the soap? I don't know, maybe hyssop. <laughs> Here's another thing, though. Here's what was probably in the soap. I got some references to show you soap, but you just have to take my word for it, okay? Uh, Jeremiah also talks about the fuller soap. And in it, it mentions nitre, N-I-T-R-E, nitre. Okay, look at Proverbs 25. Now, if you looked up nitre today and what that is, it would probably talk about the ingredients in gunpowder or something along those lines. But that's just how the history of the language goes. If you go back to the early history, you know, 1500s, even 1400s, up to the 1600s when the King James uh, was, was tra translated, it actually, you study out what they used, the English word nitre was, re was a reference to. It's kind of, it's very similar to baking soda. And so look at uh, Proverbs 25. I'm getting somewhere, right? The preaching is not all about cleaning chemicals. <laughs> Proverbs 25. And look at verse 20. As he that taketh away a garment in cold weather, and as vinegar upon nitre, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. You ever notice if you pour some vinegar on top of baking soda, what happens? Right? So, <laughs> literally, like, in the book of Job talks about these things. The book of, like, you could go back all throughout history, and, like, we're still using today a lot of the same natural cleaners that they used back then. Vinegar and baking soda is one of the best cleaners you can use. Straight baking soda it will clean a lot of things. We'll add some water to it. Add some vinegar if you really want uh, uh, these properties. So anyway, Bible has a lot to say about cleaning. And we think in reference of cleaning garments, cleaning surfaces, uh, all this kind of stuff. But what I want to talk about is the cleaning 
of the heart, the cleaning from within. Okay, and there's just three points I want to bring out here when it comes to cleaning. And these are true of the cleaning industry and, and cleaning things, but then I want to also show you how it relates to uh, the cleaning of the heart. Okay, number one is this. Cleaning is a never-ending process. All the housewives said, amen. amen, amen. <laughs> cleaning is a never-ending process. <laughs> I mean, it's like, like, I just did all the dishes. Why are there dirty dishes in the sink? That's pretty much the nature of dishes. You use them to eat, and then you put them in the sink, and it's just, you can't ever get away with that, you know? Man, some people act like they got mad at me saying that. <laughs> it's, just, it's just true, right? We eat, I mean, we can clean them ourselves, I guess, but you're going to constantly be, be doing it. Laundry. We just did all the laundry. Yeah, well, I kind of went for a run yesterday and got sweaty clothes, and so I had to throw the sweaty clothes. Winter is really bad. You got your winter clothes you put, and then you got your workout clothes, and you got all this stuff, and it's just like, ah. So husbands, here's some advice. Get your wife a nice washing machine, nice dryer, okay? I'm still working on the dryer part. Uh, it make their whole life a lot easier, <laughs> okay? Why? Because you're going to, things are going to get dirty. Things are going to get uh, nasty. Dusting, hey, dust is going to keep coming. I mean, unless you have some kind of environment, modern technology that removes the dust out of the air before it falls, you're going to have dust. You're going to have dirt. You're going to have to vacuum regularly because cleaning is a never-ending process. So what about our bodies? You know, every day you got to take a shower or you know once a week or whatever your custom is you got to get you got to get washed up cuz you're going to get dirty you're going to get nasty again uh, but what about our hearts same thing isn't it don't you wish we could just one time come to church and be like sorry god for my sins remove this stuff from me and then you go to god now i'm clean and it would just last forever or something like that it doesn't it doesn't tomorrow i mean you, you get one thing right today we just had a guy in our, in our church that said, he said, man, I, I really messed up. Uh, you know, I was walking and my neighbor's dog, you know, came and charged at me. He said, and I lost it and I, and I got mad at her and I was like, you know, hey, you need to control your dog, whatever. He said, I got in the flesh and I, and I, and, and I remember thinking about that and I was like, hey, well, I mean, we all do that. And I was thinking like probably what he needs to do is go make that right with that person. And no longer was I thinking that thought and he said, you think I should go to her and apologize? Absolutely, absolutely. Go say, you know what, the other day I yelled at you and I was just, that was wrong. I'm a Christian and I shouldn't be like that. Hey, we should deal with the fact that we have sin. And when we commit sin, it's not like it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. We just need to remove that sin. We need to go back to God and we need to say, I messed up again, God. Create in me a clean spirit. Uh, you know, renew that in me. Uh, in fact, here's the terminology in our text. It says, renew a right spirit. Verse 5 uh, I mean, uh, verse 10, it says restore in verse 12. I mean, this is basically, you know, evidence. We ha I was right once before, and now, I'm, now I got, uh, you know, I got some things that aren't so clean in my life. So I need to restore those things. I need to do it again. And guess what? Every day of your life, every day of your life. Now, when it comes to salvation, our souls are clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to heaven based on the, His righteousness, not our righteousness. You can't be clean enough to go to heaven spiritually, the inward man. Okay? That needs to be bought with, by G the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? And this is why people get so confused, because the Bible's constantly telling us you know, to get right, to stop sinning, all, this, all, all these things. And uh, look at, look at uh, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. You know, I've, I've heard people go to 1 John, kind of a works-based salvation people, and they go to 1 John, and, and uh, they make all these references and see, like, well, if you love the Lord, you're not going to sin, and you can't, you can't have sin in your life and claim to be a Christian, and all these kinds of things. And they say that, and they're, what they're trying to say is that if you sin, then you're not saved. And it's like, that is not what the Bible's saying anywhere. Anywhere in the Bible, it's not saying that. Our salvation is not based on our works, right? But here's what it says. If we, uh, verse 8, so you're John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is a faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. And then chapter 2, My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, it's like he 
kind of knows that we're going to sin, right? <laughs> if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. We're supposed to go to the Lord daily. And then when someone starts talking about our repenting of sins as a mode of salvation, it, that, that would be a never-ending process. If we had to constantly go to the Lord, repent of our sins, and get those right, and you can see why some people that believe that uh, you know, are, are, are afraid that very last, you know, those very ma- last moments of them being alive is just kind of like, please don't sin, please don't sin. I actually heard this before, like, uh, like you know, some people think suicide is like the unpardonable sin. And the reason they say that is because like, well, if you committed suicide, then you died committing a sin. And so therefore nobody could forgive you. And I've heard this, that actually when they, people used to hang a millstone around their neck, and, you know, like the Bible talks about, about that, but some people would do that for this reason. They would, they would throw that overboard, whatever, and they would let that thing take them all the way down to the depths of the sea. And then they would say, oh, God, I made a mistake, and I'm so sorry that I committed this sin. Would you please forgive me? That way they have a chance to repent <laughs> before, they, <laughs> before they die. Uh, pretty ridiculous, because that's what happens when you start thinking that, you know, you're going to have to confess all your sins and get right before God before you can be saved. None of our salvation, as far as our eternal salvation, you know, we're going to get glorified bodies, praise the Lord. There's not going to be any sin, no death, any of those things. But in this life, we continue to battle against the flesh and the spirit, okay? And we try to live in the spirit. We try to get all the sin out of our life and try to be right with the Lord and be fruitful and do all the things that he's called us to do. Uh, And that's good. That's what we need to do on a regular basis. But it is a never-ending process, Look at 1 John chapter 1. And I'm, I'm sorry, look at John chapter 13, the book of John. Gospel according to John. And look at verse 13. I mean, chapter 13. This is a passage of scripture where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, and Peter says, Not so, Lord, like you can't wash my I should be washing your feet. And 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 so Jesus says, Hey, if you don't do this, you have no part in me. So then all of a sudden Peter's like, Okay, wash my hands and my face also, right? And here's what Jesus says, uh, verse 10. He said, Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean. But not all. And he says, not all, he's talking about, he's talking about Judas. He's saying, hey, you're clean every whit, meaning that you're saved, you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't have to go back and get a shower, okay? He said, you're saved every whit, except for one, and he's talking about Judas, okay? So then, what, if, you, if you follow this out, what he's saying is like, hey, you don't have to have your whole body cleaned. It's just, it's a, just a picture, okay, an illustration he's giving. But just your feet, okay? So if I get out of the shower... And then I say, oh, man, I left something out in the car. Happens every time. Then I, I walk out, and I'm too lazy to put on shoes, and so I go walk out barefoot, come back in. What's wrong? I got muddy feet again. I got dirty feet. Wouldn't it be weird if I was just like, oh, I got to take another shower, go get in the, <laughs> in the shower off? No, I just got to wipe my feet off, right, clean my feet. Okay, so this is a picture that, hey, you don't need to be saved every time that you commit a sin. But what you do need to do is go to the Lord and say, hey, I got dirty feet again, Lord. And he can take care of that and you can get it, uh, you can get it clean. But it's a, it's a never-ending process. Every day, Lord, I messed up again. You know, I, I, and, and don't ever judge somebody and be like, well, this person keeps messing up, so they must not really be saved. Look, you mess up too. <laughs> okay? You sin too. And, uh, and I'll get to that here in a minute. But in fact, let's just go ahead and go to the next point now. Okay, so number one was... Uh, number one was it's a never cleaning is a never ending process. Number two, cleaning shouldn't have to be recognized. Things are supposed to be clean. Now, let me, let me, we, if we spend a lot of time cleaning something, we expect that somebody's going to say, wow, you did such a good job cleaning. You know, like if I went out and cleaned my car, because let's be honest, this is more of a guy thing. You, you do a little bit of work, and all of a sudden you want everybody to notice all the good work you did, right? So I come home, and I clean my car, and I come home, and I say, hey, did you see how nice the car looks? And it's like, well, what about this spot over here? Right? Because the thing is, it's supposed to be clean. 
So you don't really see that it's clean, you just see whenever it's not clean. This is the thing that frustrated me in the cleaning business. Because you, you never get a phone call that says, hey, you did a good job cleaning, everything was clean, we didn't have any issues. But you get a phone call where it's like, hey, you missed this room, or you missed this spot, or whatever, right? It's one of those things. Most jobs are like that. You don't get recognition, recognition for what you, what you do, you get recognition for what you don't do, right? As Christians, don't be offended by that. Your life should be clean. You go around all the time thinking, well, look how clean I am. Well, you're supposed to be clean. <laughs> you know, and in fact, the only reason that you look clean is if you're standing next to dirty people. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, He's pretty clean compared to what? You know what I mean? And so we shouldn't live our life trying to compare ourselves to other people and compare ourselves to how clean we are. No, you're supposed to be clean, right? And this is actually uh, true. The Bible says uh, we are supposed to be clean. In fact, look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And surely you made that, you know, again, I'm not really talking about cleaning cars and cleaning your garment and all that kind of stuff. You know, now, you know, Brother Pastor McMurtry talked this morning about, you know, when the Queen of Sheba came and she saw all these outward things and said, wow, this is great. It just glorified the Lord by what she saw. And it's true. We should glorify God with our outward appearance, right? But a lot of times that's just a reflection of what's on the inside anyway. And he mentioned that too. He's like she saw all these, all these people and they were serving, they were doing all these things. And it kind of showed their spirit that they had a right spirit and all, these, and, and all that. Okay, but we're not really talking about the outward thing. We're talking about the inward thing. And, and sometimes inwardly we feel like, oh man, I'm just such a good Christian. I don't do the things that all these other people do. And all. But you do something because we all get dirty. We all have sin. We just read that in 1 John. If you say you don't have sin, you're... You're a liar. You're making God a liar because he said we're all sinful, right? So we should work at the very basic thing as a Christian. You know, the Bible says add to your faith virtue. I mean, the very first thing we should do, we're saved. We're Christians. Now what we need to do? Well, we need to start cleaning up our lives and living, living right and, and, and trying to get some things out of our life. I mean, that's, that's, that's the least thing that we can do. There's a lot of other things you can do, but the, the, very, the very first thing you got to do is get that sin out of your life. It's like... If you go into, uh, okay, another cleaning uh, illustration. I, I, I got tons of them. I'm going to spare you most of them. But you go into a place and you're looking, okay, where am I going to start? You ever had that? You look at the, hey, one of the places, I, one of the, uh, categ- uh, I guess, uh, types of cleaning I did were apartments. Like somebody, like, you know, when they move out of an apartment, they leave all their years of however, how long they've been in there of filth. It doesn't take years. It only takes like about a week for some people to just leave absolute filth and disgusting stuff. And you go in there and you're like, wow, where do I start? Well, the first thing you got to do is, is remove all the stuff that you, you see just visibly sitting there. Like it would be weird to just get out a mop and start just like, and he's like just spreading trash around, right? You got to remove those things. First thing you do when you become a Christian, like I need to have a clean heart. I need to. I just need to live for the Lord. I need to, well, start working on getting those things out of your life. Tomorrow, messed up again. Well, get it out of your life again. Keep, get, keep removing it. Keep removing it until it gets a little bit easier to go without it. Remove those kinds of things. Uh, and the Bible says that this, these kinds of things, is giving ourselves to the Lord and working on these things. It's our reasonable service. It's the least that we can do. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, don't, you don't have to brag about it. Say, look how clean I am. Because you're supposed to be clean. It's, a, it's your reasonable service. What you're probably going to do more likely as a Christian is look at ourselves and say, man, I don't know why I can't keep this thing out of my life. <laughs> I, can't, I don't know why. But, I, but praise the Lord, I can get it out of my life. He's going to forgive. I always say this. If God told, if, if Jesus told Peter, you know, forgive 70 times 7. Because Peter's like, how many times should I forgive? 7? And Jesus is like, eh, 70 times 7. Right, which obviously he's just saying a whole lot more than seven. Right? He's not giving an act number exactly. You know, he's just saying like just a whole lot more than seven. Just keep forgiving, keep forgiving, keep. Now that's talking to an imperfect person, Peter. But God's perfect, and so what do you think? How how do you think he must feel then? Like how many times am I going to forgive you? 
well, just seven and that's it, buddy. Most of us would be in big trouble. But he's going to keep forget it, forgiving us, forgiving us. He's going to look at us and say, okay, you're clean, you're clean, you're clean. He's not going to be like, yeah, well, I'm throwing this away. It's, you know, <laughs> you know he, he just won't stay clean. Man, you're, you're, you, you just got to keep working on it, okay? And pray God will uh, help you and uh, keep, get those things out of your life. Uh, John chapter 15. John chapter 15. One of my favorite passages of Scripture. i got so many of them. Next one I read, I'll probably say the same thing. John 15. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The Bible talks about the washing of the water of the word. And remember I said water is like the greatest cleaner. I mean, there's nothing more pure than God's word. And you say, well, how do I know what I'm supposed to do? How do I know how to get things out of my life? you got to go to God's word. And you've got to go to God's Word, and, and it'll keep you clean. Okay, it'll keep you clean. And why should we worry about being clean? Well, it's our reasonable service. Yeah, but even more than that, because God's got something to do with us. He, he, he's got something for us to do that's going to bring Him glory, bring Him honor. And so He's saying, look, abide in the vine so that God can, can work through you and you can produce much fruit, which is going to, which is going to glorify the Father. All right? Now, it's, it's, you know, we understand as Christians, we got this job to do. I'm in a church here that's a, a big soul-winning church. Uh, I think I saw like 79 salvations this year. I think it was maybe more than that. Uh, we're in Kansas, Kansas. We got a soul-winning group, too. We love to go out soul-winning. And praise the Lord. You know, and, and, and here's, I'm not going to do some ex- inspection and say, hey, you can't go soul-winning with us because your life's not clean. Or, that's not what I'm saying. However, I can pretty much say based on God's word. If you're not abiding in the vine, if you're not living a clean life and removing bad things out of your life, how effective of a soul winner are you really going to be? I mean, you might produce something. You might say, hey, you know, hey, I went out there and I did this and that. But you, if you don't have a clean heart, I really question your motives. I really question what you're trying to accomplish and what you're doing. Now, go soul winning by all means. But I'm saying make it a point to say I'm going to present myself a living sacrifice to the Lord. I'm going to get these things out of my life, and I'm going to stay abiding in the vine so that I can produce fruit through the work of the Lord, through me. Because I'm clean, i got these things out of my life, and I can, I can, you say, oh, you just think you're better than everybody. No, actually, I think I'm dirty because dirt is never ending, <laughs> okay? But I am, I try to do this in my own life, and I well, think every Christian needs to do that. Try to get these things out of your life. Try to get better. Try to uh, be more effective for the Lord by doing these things. <clears throat> it is true that we need to be clean and that will help us produce more fruit. Can you imagine this? In fact, I can imagine this for sure. Uh, let's say I just got done changing my oil, get dirty, uh, dirty oil all over my hands or whatever, and then I go in into the bathroom and I'm just like, oh man, these walls are filthy. I need to clean this wall real quick. And so, uh, you know, I get a little water and then I start rubbing that spot and then the grease on my hands is now making everything more dirty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like uh, uh, you're filthy, uh, you know, you want somebody to come clean your house. And so you, you have them come and they clean your house and they come in and they got like just spots all over them and they're dirty. It looks like they haven't taken a bath in a long time. You're thinking, man, you're probably not really clean in my place. You're probably like, me. you know, that's judgmental, but I'm just saying, you know, we as Christians, there's the analogy. We as Christians, what is one of the things that we're trying to do? We're trying to bring people to the Lord. And then those people that are saved, don't we want to do more than just bring them to the Lord? We want to show them how to live, take them to God's word. But what's it going to be whenever we're hypocrites and we're coming to people saying, hey, God's word changes lives and, and you can accomplish this for God and you can stop, you can get these things out of your life and, and, and all this. I realize that's not part of salvation, but isn't something that we're supposed to do beyond salvation is bringing people to the Lord and teaching them the things of the Lord. So we do that. And in our life, you know, we've got more sins that we, the, the, to get rid of and we got all this filth in our own life. Uh, we're, we're probably causing problems. Right? This is why the Bible makes it clear. Remove the beam out of your eye before you try to help your brother get the moat out of, out of his eye. Uh, and so, so we, we have got to be clean and try to get clean. And don't get all you know, holier than thou whenever you get some things out of your life and be like, hey, look how clean I am. 
It's your reasonable service. You're supposed to be clean. You're supposed to be clean. In fact, we should notice whenever there's dirt and try to help you get that dirt out of your life. But instead, we just want everybody to just praise us for a little bit of cleanness, a little bit of things that I gave up or whatever. Okay, now this brings me to my third point, which is this. Clean doesn't have a smell or a look. Okay, let me explain this. I used to, uh, for a small period of time, I uh, had a friend who sold Shackley. Anybody familiar with Shackley? I don't even know how much they're even around anymore, but uh, sell a lot of vitamins and then natural cleaning products and all this. And for a small time, I was kind of getting in, uh, you know, he was trying to show me that stuff. I wasn't selling it, but I wanted to buy some things. And apparently, if you become a member, then you get better deals and all this kind of stuff. So I was trying to get in that. And so I sat through this little class where this guy's trying to tell you about all these things. And, and he said, you know, some, this guy said, you know, some people don't really like our cleaning products because they say, well, I just don't, it just doesn't smell. Like, I want something. Remember I mentioned bleach? Like, I want something that when you're done, people are like, oh, you've been cleaning in here, <laughs> right? And so he used this phrase that's always stuck with me. He said, here's the thing, though. Clean doesn't have a smell, all right? Now, he could have been just trying to sell his product. and <laughs> just, yeah, Clean doesn't have a smell, right? They use these products. They're good. But isn't it true? Isn't it true, okay? So if somebody, again, sprays some bleach in the air, so you come in and say, oh, your house is just so clean. And really, they fooled you. <laughs> you just think it's clean because you smelt that bleach and you're just like, oh, wow, this, this house is just amazing. You must clean all the time. But if you start inspecting a little bit, you'll find all kind of dirt and all that stuff. That smell didn't mean anything. All right. Uh, you go in and, and somebody's just got these candles going and all this stuff. You go, oh, how lovely. Yeah. And they dim the lights down low so you can't see the dirt and you just smell that smell. And you're like, oh, it's so clean in here. Clean doesn't have a smell. Clean doesn't have a smell. Now, Cleaning supplies leave smells. You ever clean with vinegar and, uh, I almost said nitre. <laughs> you ever clean with vinegar and baking soda? I don't like the smell of vinegar. And anytime I've tried to clean something for my wife in the house, maybe there's some stubborn stain in the tub or something, and she's like, hey, can you help me out? Yeah, I get the vinegar and I get the baking soda and I, and I scrub that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you don't have to do it, all right? <laughs> and I scrub that. And then my wife's like, what did you use? It stinks. Hey, it's clean. <laughs> but it smells like vinegar. Yeah, but it's clean. <laughs> right? Cause, cause, so here, here's, the, here's the point. So in our lives, you know, we can use all these products that might leave some kind of a smell. Bleach, ammonia. I'm hesitating to say this. So I was reading about, because ammonia is another chemical that's been used for many centuries. You know how the Romans used ammonia? Urine. That's where they got ammonia. So you want to clean with ammonia? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's disgusting. But, but uh, ammonia, that's really strong stuff. If you're going to clean with that, well, just don't clean with it, probably. But, <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, it's really, and don't ever mix it with bleach. Okay, but ammonia is a really strong cleaning product. But man, it leaves quite a, quite a smell. Uh, have you ever cleaned, has anyone ever purified their air with an it's an air purifier, and supposedly, like, it removes all the toxins and stuff out of the air, and, and like, when you breathe that fresh air, because this, this machine has, like, I don't know, like, deionized, or I don't know what it does, but takes the bad stuff out of the air, and, uh, and it always has a weird smell, but, like, what you're really smelling is nothing. <laughs> you're just expecting to smell something, but you smell nothing, and it almost seems, it almost seems kind of weird. All right, now, we need to... In our lives, we're, we're trying to get things out of our lives, and we're trying to, to clean up for the Lord. Now, look, don't be fooled by the person who's just always spraying perfume on the, on their, over their stink. You know what I mean? In gym class, we always say, how I many of y'all had the guys in the gym class never took their stuff home and washed them, but they just sprayed deodorant? That only works for so long, and then it's like, dude, go wash your gym clothes. <laughs> All right? So the truth is in our life, a lot of times people don't want to clean up their life. What they want to do is just spray stuff on there. They're like, look how good I am. Look how good I am. Look at all the stuff I do for the Lord. It's like, man, you're dirty. We all know it. <laughs> okay? Now, if you're doing something for the Lord, great. But my Bible says in, in, in John 15, you know, if, you, if you don't abide in me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. So if you're trying to produce all this stuff on yourself, it might just be you know, these odorants that you're putting in the air. <laughs> okay, 
I guess deodorants, I don't know. <laughs> Just, you're putting these smells in the air and you're trying to put this perfume, you're trying to cover up. Uh, very possible, very possible. And I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying get the, get the dirt out of your life and don't try to fool people by all these uh, outward uh, shows, of the outward appearance. However, as Christians, I believe it, 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 it I should say this, it isn't enough. Okay, uh, let's just go to verse. I made references. Let's go to Second Peter chapter one. One of my favorite verses. <laughs> Seriously, Second Peter chapter one. I love this passage because it starts out talking about those who have obtained like precious faith. Okay, he's saying to those people that are saved, those people that are in the faith, those are the ones I'm talking to now. Does having faith in Jesus Christ, is that difficult or easy? Okay, that sounds like a trick question. <laughs> Putting faith in the works of Jesus Christ, does that mean you did the works or Jesus did the works? Jesus did the works, right? So really faith is easy. You didn't have to do it. All you have to do is put your trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. That's easy. I know. Easy believism. It's, it's, it's easy. It's easy. Faith is, is easy, Okay. And here's what we, we know. Here's what he's saying. You've obtained like precious faith. And here's what he says in verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence. Now that sounds like something hard, doesn't it? Yeah, but we're not talking about your salvation. We're talking about what you're adding to your salvation. Okay, so here's what it says. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. Now look, knowledge puffeth up, doesn't it? If you just get all this Bible knowledge and, man, I know the Word of God like nothing else and all that stuff, you could impress people for sure. Wow, that guy knows his Bible. He's so smart. It's just deodorant on stinky gym clothes. <laughs> you know what I mean? First, you get that sin out of your life. You live a virtuous life. You try to find out what is, how do I live like a Christian? What do I need to get out of my life? How do you do that? Well, first of all, you go to God and say, blot out my transgressions, get rid of this stuff. Take the sins out of my life. And then you go and you uh, read God's word and like water, it begins to wash those things out of your life so that you're clean. And then you say, okay, now what I do? Now add to your virtue knowledge. Add to knowledge temperance. Add to temperance patience. Add to patience godliness. And to godliness brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness charity. Now we should be trying to do all those things, but I feel like it's actually there in a pretty good order for us to realize, hey, my goal is I want to be, uh, I want to have brotherly kindness. I want to have charity. I want to be able to go out there and reach the world and love on people and get people saved and all that kind of stuff. But look, you just want to jump to the end and forget to remove the sin out of your life. You're causing some problems there. Okay. Uh, do it by all means. Show brotherly kindness. Do it by all means. Go out there, go soul winning, show charity. I, I, I want you to do all those things. But don't just try to skip there and not do these other things. It's very important. Look, at, look back at our text. And I'll finish with this because I, I believe this is how he finishes on that same point. Let's start with verse 10 and I'll read to the, to the end. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Psalm 51, verse 10. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Look what he says. Then will I teach transgressors thy way. Be kind of hard to teach transgressors their way whenever you're the one in transgression. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou lighteth not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Now let me ask you this. Did God ever say he wanted sacrifices? Of course the Bible talks about sacrifices. Does it talk about, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, giving things to the Lord and, and, and bringing things to the temple and burnt offerings and all this kind of stuff all throughout the Old Testament. You say, well, yeah, well, this is the Old Testament and, uh, and we're, we're in the New Testament, so these things don't apply to us. I'm so sick of people saying that the Old Testament doesn't apply to us because we're, look, let's keep reading. He just said that God doesn't want sacrifice. What he wants is a contrite spirit. He wants a, a, a clean heart, right? That's true for us today, too. Okay. Now, what, now, once we have the clean spirit, then what does he want us to work on? And again, I'm not saying don't do good works until you're clean because that ain't never going to happen. Okay? But, but you want to first work on your inward heart, and then you can be able to do more works, more exploits. And you can you know, do good works so that men might see your righteousness and glorify God. Look at verse uh, 17 then. I mean verse 18. Let's read 17 again. And sac uh, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, who, who thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Okay, now that part doesn't apply to us, but, <laughs> but the application does. The application does. Look what it says. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then shalt thou offer bullocks upon thine altar. Look, God wants us to do great works for him. He wants us to be a people, holy, a people uh, full of good works. And praise the Lord, I believe that this church is accomplishing that and, and seeing a lot of good things done for the Lord. But don't forget that cleaning your heart, having the right spirit, having the right attitude is a daily process. You can't forget. You can't forget to attend to that and make sure in your life that you're clean. And don't think, hey, well, everybody should recognize how clean I am. No. You need to work on that privately. You need to work on that in your own life, not try to brag about how clean you are. Look, you're supposed to be clean, all right? And, and don't try to compare yourself with other people. Say, well, I'm not as dirty as that person. doesn't matter. You're still dirty, okay? And so, so you need to try to work on these things. We all need to work on these things. And then, and then don't think that your cleanness you know, your, the, the smell, you know, all the sacrifices and all these decorations and all these things that you're adding are actually uh, a sign of cleanness because they're not. That should be a lesson to us all, too. There are a lot of false prophets out there and, and people who claim to do all these good works for the Lord, the Matthew 7 type people. Lord, Lord, we've done many wonderful works in thy name. Uh, look, but they haven't actually, they're not actually even saved, these people. All right. And so we know that a Christian... Even, I'm talking about even a saved person, has a, they're, they're bought with Jesus' blood, they're going to be in heaven one day, but in this life they can fool you and think how good of a Christian I am by all their outward appearance. And there's all this sin in their life. Okay, uh, I'm not telling you to judge them, though. I'm trying to tell you to focus on your own self, get those things out of your life, and then the Lord will be able to do more with you. I uh, hope that makes sense. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you uh, for your forgiveness Thank you for your love and your mercy on us. And uh, certainly we know none of us will ever be perfect in this life. Uh, we'll never be without sin. Daily we'll have to uh, uh, ask to re that you would help us to renew that right spirit and that we get these things out of our lives. Uh, Father, help us focus on that first and foremost. And then, Lord, help us to be able to produce much fruit. Uh, for therein is, is the Father glorified that we, do much, that we bear much fruit. Help us to do those things and be fruitful unto you for your honor and glory, not for our own. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.